Hey, I'm Jonathan, and I live in London, England. Hey, I'm Jeff, and I live in Perth, Australia. Together, we are Echo and Sidetrack. We produce music that sounds like this. And this. And even this. This podcast is about music, creativity, and everything in between the giant space that separates us. Welcome to A Band Apart with Echo and Sidetrack. Hey, Jeff. Hey, buddy. How are you today? I am good. Feeling positive on my Monday. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Uh, let's let's start this episode off with a bit of news, shall uh, we? Yeah. We should have a little news theme like... Um, in Echo and Sidetrack related news, we have some new music coming out. Whoa. And to celebrate that new music, we're going to have a party as well. Uh, you'll see it on our social media and uh, wherever else. It's on October the 9th. It's at Jack Rabbit Slims here in Perth. And we're going to have a bit of a fun with it. We're going to have a bit of a dress up party, the 90s rave vibe. And we're also going to live stream it. So everyone will be able to get involved in the, uh, in the party. International family. International fam. Uh, yeah. Uh, so it be, should be lots of fun. Sweet. Uh, that's really fun and exciting. It is. And the new song that's coming out is a collaboration with Lee Matthews, um, our brothers from across the pond, the Tasman Sea. No, across the Tasman Sea. If it was across the pond, it would be across the Atlantic. Yes. Yes. Or the Channel. Oh, no, the pond is the Atlantic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not the Channel. I mean, that's exciting for you because you're going to be doing the show because I'm, of course, in a different country. But for me, I'm actually playing my first show this weekend in Germany. Ooh, that's very exciting. Yeah, I am really excited about it. I will um, send you some uh, some things to play and test. Um, when do you leave? Uh, I leave on Thursday morning. Uh, Jake and I just changed our flights. So I think we leave at 8 from Heathrow. It's, my house is not easy to get to Heathrow from. Let me tell you. No, what do you have to do? Go down to, I mean, it's, it's, we don't need details, but why don't you just no. get a car? Yeah, I might do. It's still like an hour drive. I know. I was, staying, I was thinking about staying on Jake's and then jumping on the tube, but we'll see what happens. Nice one. Well, that's exciting. Yeah, um, yeah I'm, I'm super excited to play, just play music, man. And like, you know, I've got obviously sent through some mixes when we were planning the set that you played a couple of weeks ago at the court. Yep. Uh, and I've got more of them that like just didn't get used. And I know just like little, little arcs that I look forward to playing. I was going to hire out some decks or like go to Pirate Station, Pirate Studio, sorry, uh, and get some decks. But I don't think I'm going to have time before I leave. You should. That'd be fun. It'd be a good little reminder to touch the decks before you play. Yeah. Surely someone you know has got a pair of turntables you can just like borrow. Uh, but yeah, I'm excited for that, man. Just also leave the country. Germany's, the weather there is quite nice at the moment. It's sunny. I'm going to try to find a lake. Oh yeah, definitely do a lake so we can um, lake it up like we did um, in Berlin last year. Um, have you got in touch with uh, Reese? I have. I have got in touch with Reese, and I'm very excited to see him, see him and Aaron. Yeah, it's going to be like a couple of days of... Frolicking. That's beautiful. There's an Anthony Bourdain episode on Cologne of Parts Unknown. So I'm going to watch that and get some ideas. And also just, you know, Reese will show me around and take me out of the good spots. I'm just going to just take off my jumper. Okay. I did exactly the same thing when you were talking to me and you must have been inspired. Now you're taking off your headphones so you won't hear anything I'm saying during this time. But um, yeah, the whole act of playing shows again is an exciting prospect. Um, just to be able to go out there and party. I saw um, a few people have played some sit-down shows and a few people have played some uh, very low capacity shows in parts of Europe. So yeah, I think uh, Brendan Futurebound went and played in Czech Republic. Katie Coven played in. 
I think the Czech Republic again. Yeah, it was a rampage thing, I think. But um, it's all it's all you know coming and going in various ways. Is London going into a lockdown, Jonathan? I don't think so, unless something's happening out there that I don't know about. No, uh, basically from today, um, which I didn't know ex- the exact details of. I just kind of heard rumors, but uh, a friend told me some more about it on Saturday night. You can't have gatherings for more than six people. Okay, but you can still go to the pub. You can still go to the pub, but you can only sit in groups of up to six. And I believe that over half those people need to be from your household. That's a strange thing to police. Someone a lot smarter than us has definitely come up with these measures and thought this is the least invasive way to do it, but also keep social distancing. Surely. I would imagine so. It's not just, you know, they're not coming up with this number of six just out of the air. So I'm sure there's lots of thought being put into it, but it does seem a bit of just a random choice to make. I, I, I think they're avoiding having to close down more businesses or take away any kind of... Uh, Things that's going to help boost the economy. Yeah, you've you've got a bunch of new cases. Your cases have gone up since been st- going up steadily since July, but really c- kind of kicked off at the start of August. So, or start of st- end of August. Sorry. So, that's probably why they're trying to slow things down. I wonder if that's all connected to people going on holiday. Everyone's tried to squeeze in their summer holiday, so they've gone to countries that have maybe had lax rules. Yeah. And so they're coming back. Like I I don't I think you could just maybe be like okay, no air travel outside of UK for I I don't know. Again, maybe that's maybe they looked at that possibility and that wasn't a possibility. But I do know that going into winter as we come to the end of summer, if we do have to go into another lockdown, it's going to become you know a bit more grim. Locking down in winter would be a lot more depressing than locking down in summer. But again, I don't think they I don't think they can do it. I don't think we can afford another lockdown. I don't think anyone can afford another lockdown. I think this whole experience has shown us that you just can't press pause on the world. Well, I, I think it's shown us that we can press pause on the world if if we can press pause completely. It's it's about people following the rules and uh, and I mean, there's this, yeah, like you said, smarter people than us thinking about the ways that things don't completely grind to a halt. But um, yeah, it's interesting to look at some of the things happening in Victoria and even New Zealand. I think has had some protests about it. Yeah, and you're like that. That's the wrong way to go about it, guys. Like you've, there's clearly some issues. We just need to like tighten everything up. Protesting and gathering together. And saying it's unfair isn't going to make it, like, change. I was actually talking to Raya just before about this. There are some things that they're doing that seem a bit uh, big brothery, like a bit like government knows best. And I think people are kind of pissed off because we all pay taxes and we all fund this machine that's supposed to look out, look after us and kind of run things well. And often they fuck a lot of stuff up. So I think people are saying like, well, you guys are just going to fuck this up too. You can't tell me exactly what to do. You can't tell me when I can do stuff or when I can't do stuff. And the laws in uh, the laws in Victoria seem to be quite heavy-handed. Yeah, because they um, fucked up. They were very close to eradicating it and then it came out because, I, don't, I mean, I don't, again, I don't really know why, but it seems like it was poorly managed. And then... The people have got it in their heads that it's like against their rights and it's all this kind of stuff. But it's like it, it thing, things went things went wrong. It wasn't handled properly, which means all the more reason you have to handle it properly now. Yeah, because totally we don't want to. Because otherwise, you're just going to get more unhappy that things aren't like you know. Why can't I leave my house? Why can't I do this? It's like because you're not fucking following the rules. I don't know. There's in in Australia, it, it's um it's the cases are quite low, and we're trying not to make them big. The thing I the thing I worry about now is like Australia is now vulnerable if it does get in. Like herd immunity is a a kind of terrible way to 
go at the idea because there's a guaranteed loss of life. But once we all go through, pass through the veil of COVID, there should be some sort of immunity to it so we, we don't get hit by it hard. But now Australia might be like locked off to the rest of the world until there is a vaccine. Yeah, which mean hopefully is by Christmas or early next year or something like that. So, yeah, I think it, we're closer to a vaccine than we've ever been. And I think that's the kind of game that we've got to be looking forward to. I don't think anything's going to change that radically in Australia until there is a vaccine. Um, but again, you're literally, if you're listening to this, <laughs> you're listening to two drum and bass producers talk about COVID-19, which is like, I, I barely read anything. I, I flick through Twitter and I occasionally read a little bit of something that seems reasonably bipartisan, but um, it's just kind of how I feel. How are you feeling over there looking down the barrel of winter? You've never really spent a winter in Europe. I arrived in Europe a year ago, three days, three days ago. Yeah, we were, we were there last, this time last year. Yeah. So I've been, I've been here for about a year, but I did, I came home for a month in December. So I had the cold, but I got out of a month of it. So I'm kind of looking forward to it, to be honest. I like the rain. Don't love the dark. Uh, but yeah, it's going to be good. The, the house I'm in now is quite warm and cozy, which mm. I think is a, you know, like a, to have a house that's, that you don't mind being in all the time is, is pretty good. I'm near some pubs, got my friends. I just need a good jumper. I could buy you one for your birthday. Yeah, maybe. There's actually, there's, you've actually got a, butt, uh, a jumper on the way. Butt plug? In the... Um, <laughs> A b- b- butt plug. Um, you now you've got a jumper on the way in your care package that is going to be winging its way to you in a matter of days. I, I probably also need to buy like a jacket, like a good jacket. My um, as much as I love my Uniqlo jacket, that's it needs to be warmer. You need layers, bruh. So yeah, preparing, preparing for the layers of winter. So you're off to Cologne on Friday. Um, but I read in a group message thread that you're meant to have another appointment on Friday. Yes. Yeah, so my waxing was supposed to be on Friday. So it wasn't as far away as I thought it would be. But obviously now I'm going to be in a different country. So we're going to have to rearrange maybe for when I come back. I, the, the prospect of it being so close was, was yeah sudden did anyone get back to our message we put on our instagram uh, a few people people just wish you luck really it wasn't anything nothing too graphic no real piece of advice someone said told me the other day that's like oh it's gonna hurt it's definitely gonna hurt yeah i i started watching 40 year old virgin last night in the scene where he's getting waxed he's getting waxed on his chest yeah and he's like bleeding from his chest and shit like Oof. it's not I don't know. My hair is probably not as coarse as Steve Carroll's chest hair. But still, it's not going to be... It's going to be painful, yeah. Yeah, it sure is. Um, what drew you to 40-year-old virgin? Or were you looking for waxing tips? No, no, no. I was, I'd just never seen it. And I had had a long day at work and just wanted a bit of like a hangover chill m- movie. The best line in that is, smoke my pole. And the guy says it when he's out the back. He says, someone's like, smoke this. And he says, smoke my pole. That's, I I think that's the line. Or either way, the, he, the people he works with are really funny. Yeah. And it's kind of like the first, one of the first ones of those Judd Apatow, Paul Rudd, Seth Rogen. Yeah. Uh, ensemble comedy things. And I'd just never seen it. Like I've never seen... I've never seen a few of those movies that are apparently quite good. Like Dinner for Schmucks is apparently quite funny. I've let some of those movies just sit because I'll watch them at a time and I'll have no expectations because when they came out, I said, I don't really want to do this because I feel like this is going to be a paint by numbers kind of thing. Like, 
I don't think Talladega Nights is very funny. Yeah, I, I would agree. Because I it's like people, it's like they rinsed the Anchorman model after Anchorman was so successful. Yeah. Like old school Anchorman, there's like one or two others Step around. Brothers. So, yeah, Step Brothers. It, great. And then it just started getting, the stories just started getting rinsed and you're like, I know what's going to happen. This is... Uh, this is a bit of a push, and so I just kind of stopped watching them. So I'm actually um reasonably surprised whenever I watch a, a kind of a funny movie. I get a few little laughs out of it, and I'm like, oh, low expectations. Something you see as well that you start to recognize if you watch a lot of those movies in you know quick succession is how they do so much improvisation. Yeah, for sure. And you see that in the edit, you're like. Oh, that's an improvised line. They just let the camera roll on that, like, and also the way they shoot, they that they'll just shoot like a two shot, like two people side by side, yeah. and they'll just keep saying lines, and they'll yeah. just keep improvising, and then they'll just pick yeah. what they think is the funniest one. Yeah, but you I, can. I mean, it, it does lack a little bit of flow at times. Yeah, but you, you see that in um, forty year old version with with the uh, Paul Rudd and Seth Rogen of like, you know how I know you're gay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That scene that's like just kind of goes back and forth between them. Yeah. I mean, you know, parts of it, it can be funny. Like a lot of the improvisation in Anchorman is hilarious, but I don't know. You just see it in the the way it flows. Uh, but, but Jeff, both of us have seen a movie recently mm. uh, that we still haven't spoken about. So I thought maybe we could talk about it on the podcast with a extreme spoiler alert. Let's let's do a spoiler alert. And if you haven't seen Tenant, don't listen to this podcast or don't continue to listen to this podcast. Yeah. Before you go see Tenant, which is Christopher Nolan's new movie. It's now been out for a week or two, but we're giving you lots and lots of time to stop the podcast if you'd like to not hear any spoilers or not hear us talk about Tenant. So what did you think of Tenant? I really, really liked it. I um I gotta admit, I was uh I love how it throws you into it. I love how it just throw like within forty five seconds you're like, what? Hold on a second, what's going on here? Like you do, and I think the first set the first setup, you are um, what's the word? Like, um, intentionally off guard. You don't know what's yeah. happening. You're like, is that who's that? Is that Robert Patterson? Like, what's what's going on? Like, what are they talking about this piece? Like, what's happening at the end? Patterson's like, he's basically been inversion, living in inversion the whole time, right? Yeah. Oh. Um. This is where the concept of it is so confusing. Like, when it goes to different timelines, how can someone be moving back through time but also be moving... Like, it's it's not a time machine. You just start going. But it's like a door that you then go back through. Yes. Um, and that's the weirdest thing is that Robert Patterson was... Pattinson was talking about how they'd been, they were friends and this is the end, but really it's just the beginning. So really the protagonist is about to meet the first time he meets Robert Pattinson. Yeah. Well, that's because it was, it wasn't in India when they were there. No. And that's why the first time they meet there, he's like, he he gets him a Diet Coke instead of a water. Yeah. But they, um, so but, like he already, but they had never, he already knows him. They had never met though. No, no but Patterson had met him. Yes, but the protagonist Which means had that, not. Yeah, it's fucking confusing. Yeah, and I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so let's stop talking theories because I, I mean, I've yeah. watched any YouTube things or anything. This is just me coming out of thing, being like, yeah, the the first scene kind of. On, upon reflection, kind of baffled me upon about where it would be happening in the timeline. Yeah, 
I think the things that the whole final scene with any time there was people moving backwards and forwards baffled me at the same time. Well, it was like the th- the scene was existing and people got there and arrived backwards into it. Yeah. And some guys arrived before it. And this, yeah, it's a really shitty exa- uh, explanation. But yeah, I know what you mean. I feel like I need a um a drawing. Christopher Nolan needs to do some whiteboard shit, maybe with a clear yeah. whiteboard or something. Yeah, like numbers. Yeah, that guy. Um, but yeah, I I think as a spectacle, the movie's awesome. Like after reading, there's only two hundred and forty visual effects shots in the whole yeah. movie. No blue screen. Yeah, no blue screen, no green screen. All of that was done in camera. You could, you could kind of see it and it looks really cool. Like parts where they're kind of running weird and you're like, Are they, yeah. what's going on there? It's like because they're running in a – they're practiced running backwards and that's what they look like when they run backwards. Yeah. The plane itself, the crash is, is impressive because it's real. But – all the post stuff that happens after all the fires, all the firemen and everything, all that would have been shot forwards with the protagonist and Pattinson running backwards through all of that to make that look like it did. Um, and I, I, I like the fact that they have they had to kind of go back to that location to to go backwards again, like to find another rotatory thing. Rotor. Yeah. Um, which is quite interesting. I really should have, uh, if I knew what we were going to talk about Tenant, I would have tried to formulate some slightly more cohesive, uh, insights, but, um, it's good. Did you, did you like it though? I thought it was Chris Van Orn's worst film. Oh, interesting. But I, that's also a man who's every one of his films I've really, really liked. He hasn't made a bad movie you could maybe argue insomnia is his worst film this is not this is definitely one of the most um ambitious films and definitely challenging and like if it was told with no if time if the concept of inversion wasn't a thing in the movie it's basically a really cool bond movie yeah which I kind of think he wanted to do. Um, but there's, uh, yeah, the concept of inversion was yeah, perhaps a little bit glossed over. But that said, I think if they had have dwelled on it too much, you'd start to, your brain would start to ask too many questions and you'd be taken out of the movie. Like you should never yeah. be, in a movie, you should never be sitting there going, oh, he's, um, is he, wait, hold on a second. Is he inverted now? And that's he's breathing the inverted gas, but is oh, he's not breathing it now. So is he inverted? Like you shouldn't be thinking like that. You should just be keep sweeping onward. Like it's like you should not thinking about be thinking about time. Ironically, in a movie, like you're not like oh when do they stop and eat dinner? Like how, how, did they get on that flight and it went for eight hours? Did what you know? You should it just like sweeps you along. Well, that's why I think that it's it's an important movie and will be seen as like a point in cinema where one could argue that cinema is a bit like franchise-based and a bit dead and telling the same stories and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, absolutely. It's like a filmic, filmically challenging piece of art. Like, you know, to walk away from like, the budget was like two hundred and fifty million or something. It was like a big blockbuster film. To walk away from a big blockbuster film, and and to be like, okay, that was challenging as well. You had to think about it. Like, what was the last big blockbuster film you had to think about? Probably would have been another Christopher Nolan one. Yeah, like it's it's quite it's it is quite insane that you know the cinemas now are just filled with franchise Marvel movies that have you know there's so many of them that they've created their own set of fans and everything like that that um 
people have kind of confused them for being good. Mm. And they're like, oh, no, that movie's, they're like, you know, they say like, oh, it's the new Avengers movie. And you're like, hey, 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 hold on a second. This is the fourth movie. This is the third movie or whatever in a franchise. You're watching a a soap opera play out on screen. This is, you're buying into all these characters. Like this is, you know, if if this was a 13 episode show, you just watch the show and that would be the end of it. You just It's just being dragged out mm. and it's all pretty, you know, eh low yeah, I mean nothing don't let's not try and take anything away from them they're fine I, don't, I just don't watch them so but that's become everything like every year there's six of them so people go to the cinema six times they see nothing but Marvel movies and the occasional thing like that cinema's not very risky anymore yeah I would agree and I mean argu- arguably like you know a Christopher Nolan movie isn't very risky because you could watch a lot more challenging Cinema, but the fact that this is a big budget, you know, Hollywood production, and there is a bit of challenge to it. I, I think there's some like exciting um, movies coming out. Uh, Charlie Kaufman has a new one on Netflix, mm-hmm. which looks really cool. Um, uh, obviously, um, June looks like it's it's going to be cool. I like these guys that like, you know, it's like they've been tested over the last 10 years and now they're like, studios are like, we're going to give you $200 million and you're going to make that epic movie and we don't mind if it's three hours because I feel like for the longest time there was like, no one was really taking any risks. Like they need to return back to that like auteur director kind of thing. Like tell your story. Here's, here's, a, here's a chunk of change. Let's tell your story and let's make it yeah. really good. The fact that Netflix allowed Scorsese to make a three and a half hour cut of The Irishman yeah. was a big turning point. And people, like, they realized that people people's attention spans would last that long. Would they go to the movies for that long as well? Because it, classically, it's like a movie over two, two hours, two and a half hours, it's just not, people just won't watch it. Well, man, people's attention spans have never been shorter and that's just been dwindling off you know, for the last 20 years. But now, but some, if you are presented with the right thing, mum and dad went and watched Lawrence of Arabia the other night. That's a four hour movie with an intermission. Hell of a movie. I've never seen it. This is that concept is like, oh yeah, this is how long we needed to tell the story. So we told the story in that long. Yeah. You know, can you imagine if, you know, Tenant or, you know, any movie recently, can you imagine if Inception was asked to be ninety minutes or hundred and ten? Just wouldn't it would work. just be a, it'd just be a piece of shit. Like you just be like, what is going on? You need time to, you know, draw out the characters and and the story and create the tension and everything like that. I mean, arguably in Tenant, you it's not the protagonist that you kind of care about. It's what he cares about, which is um quite an interesting little take. But um, ironically, I don't think there's any spoilers in what we just talked about. No, neither do I. But I mean, just talking about things, talking about movies is, can be seen as a spoiler. I agree. I put spoiler alerts before any sort of chitter chatter. Um, to change the angle slightly, are you tired? Not had a party on Friday Saturday and worked all of yesterday. Oh, you got that. Weekend tiredness. Ah, good. Yeah, I know the feeling. I didn't drink on the weekend and I feel fucking pretty great. That's great. I did drink on the weekend. In fact, I think I drank probably my body weight in espresso martinis. Whoa. Yeah, that'll make you um see the devil. Yeah, man, like honestly, mixing alcohol and coffee is so fun, but like definitely mentally detrimental. You just gotta have like you have one of them, or you have two of them max. You, like you yeah, can't, but you not, can't. You, not they're, when <laughs> they're not your all night drink. We've <laughs> we've seen that at the parties that we used to host at Bull Street. Yeah. People get fucking crazy, man. Yeah, I, and I think that's kind of what happened to me a little bit on Saturday night. Like, 
because we went to a bar for a friend's birthday and it was really fun. So seeing a lot of people that I hadn't seen in a while and like lots of funny chats and and stuff. But like, you know, you drink a beer and then you have an espresso martini and then you have a margarita and like you could buy rounds and it's just like, oh, like and you drink an espresso martini, it's almost like you drink a, coffee. a double shot espresso. Yeah. Yeah, just like quite quick. And then you have like two or three of them and you've had fucking six shots of coffee or whatever. I think they were actually using cold brew or like a cold filter or, or something. So I'm not exactly sure how much coffee was in them. But I realized yesterday, I was like, oh, that's why, that's why I feel so shit today. Yeah. You're, I mean, mixing drinks does it. Mixing drinks makes you feel like ass. Um, drinking a lot of coffee will rinse your adrenal gland as well and leave you feeling extremely um, deflated. Yeah. And drinking all the sugary stuff as well. You know, you just have a shitload of sugar and then you like have a low the next day as well as being super hungover and dehydrated. So you got a bunch of a bunch of things at play. Well, Are you bit tired as well? How was your, uh, how was your day yesterday? Uh, my Sunday was great, man. Yeah, I, um, went to the gym, I did some, uh, things around the house and then I decided I was going to paint in the backyard. So I set up an easel that I was given for Christmas years ago and, um, and yeah, just decided to paint and I only had two colors, three colors in acrylics. But I didn't. I decided to just like not let anything stop me. I was like, I found some brushes. I found three colors in acrylic. I had orange, blue, and white, and um, I just went for it. Like I didn't know what I was going to paint. And I opened one of the many magazines that I have, and I just said, "That looks good." Cut it out, stuck it on a board, um, put the paper on a board, and just kind of like sketched it and put some headphones on and stood out in the sun and just vibed out. Drank a little bit of coffee. How long did you paint for? Three hours? Yeah. And so I found it, um, like I haven't painted like that since high school, mm. which is pretty crazy. Um, but I found, like, I thought I would be quite shit or at least be like overly judgmental on what I was doing. But as with some of my drawing recently, I, um, I've uh, realized that like it's all about working into your like not stopping like it's all about working keep on working into the art you're working on I suppose it's like refining a song idea mm. um, like with the paintbrushes I was like okay I've got this dark background I've got the shape of this, this female's back and that I'm working on and things like that and I was like well that the tone of that area doesn't look right it doesn't look very like dark or it's not the right shade almost and I was like well I guess I have to just put more paint there and mm. like if I put more paint there then I have to put more paint there but I can't put less paint on but I can make that section lighter near it so it's all about creating like depth and contrast by adding more because you can't take stuff away so think of it as yeah. um yeah and I, I yeah I quite in, again, just impressed myself by just you know mixing colors on the fly. I didn't mix, you know. I think there's probably some better practices I could get with mixing colors, but at the same time, I wasn't going for realism. I have drawn and painted a lot in the past, going for realism, looking for that realistic thing. And I remember reading an article years ago with an artist and he was like, that's what I did in all throughout college. I, you know, the ultimate thing would be to draw the most realist thing. So I'd spend hundreds of hours drawing this large scale, real things. Someone that you should look up if you haven't is uh, CJ Hendry. Hendry. Um, she does amazing um, objects and she like, you know, they're often uh, kind of like, um, objects in the zeitgeist that you know kind of pop culture things and she does amazing pencil drawings and um she's sick but back to what i was saying um and he was like i so this this goal was realism and i was like obsessed and then one day i drew this amazing 
um, picture of this barn and the light coming in and everything. And like, I, I finished it hundreds of hours. And then I was like, fuck yeah, that looks just like the photo. And then he was like, whoa. And he just had this realization like, if you want something that looks like this, you take a photo. And he's like, it's more, it should be more about expression. Like, it should be more about free flowing ideas. How you perceive a photo. Yeah. And how you communicate that. So he kind of, he went back the other way and then he like started making stuff that was as rough as it could be while still maintaining the form of the thing. And that's how he developed his style. But he, he says that if he um hadn't have gone through that photorealism phase, he would never have had that realization and his loose stuff wouldn't be as good. And so, I, again, I just tried to go without, you know, I'm not saying I'm an artist, but go without judgment and not try and make it real. And just And just like, you know, put paint down and be like, okay, what needs to happen there? That needs to be darker. Well, the only two colors I can make a darker color is if I mix my purple and my blue. It's funny that you say that you're not an artist, even though you quite clearly are. Yeah, I, I suppose, you know, reflecting back on that. You're not a professional, you're not a professional artist who gets paid for his art. Or yeah. you're not known as a professional artist. Yeah. Yeah. But you're an artist. It man, I tell you what, it was really nice. Like it made me go, I want to do more of this and um, uh, spend more time, carve out and prioritize more time to create freely, because it mm. makes me feel really good. And I like the way I I feel more aligned when I do it. Like I get a real fucking buzz from it and a real, it's like a return to like being a child, having fun. And, and like, again, like, um, realizing that what I did was pretty good or I thought it was pretty good. Um, was like, oh, like an extra little nudge. Um, so yeah, I'm going to try and block out more time, uh, another time this week to kind of do it again and. Um, because I, it made me feel, yeah, like, uh, like an artist, like someone who is creating, not just someone who has to like meet a deadline or, you know, has to do something for homework. I was like, oh, I'm just like creating. And that was quite cool. So yeah, I had a great little Sunday. That's lovely. Maybe I'll try to, I haven't done any art since I did my, I was doing my like crayon paintings. Oh, well, you inspired me the other week, so that was that's that's a good thing. Uh, just get into it, man. Just block out two hours and just and like really put your phone down and uh, doing a little bit of prep beforehand like helps. Like, don't go okay. Now I've got two hours and it, where are my pencils? Where am I? Oh, I don't have any paper. Oh, my desk yeah. isn't tidy. Do that and then be like, and now I have two. You know, you got your pencil in your hand and then you're like two hours now. You, know, you make yourself a coffee. It's sitting there. You've got no other distractions to potentially go off and do something. Like someone called me during it, and I just didn't even answer the phone. I was listening in my headphones. I was listening to music as well, and I just put on like something I'd never listened to. I um I just like someone sent me an album two weeks ago. It was like this early two thousands like remix album that was all kind of like trip hop, kind of like. Um, soul remixes and stuff. It's quite cool. It was just like, again, just like... What's the album? Uh, it's called Verve Remixed. It was like a... It's pretty seminal kind of like early 2000s, late 90s. Um, yeah, kind of cafe music, I guess. But it's like, it, yeah, it exists in that, in that realm. Um, yeah, it's kind of cool. But again, just... I was just in a little nice little zone and um, that, you know, having exercise, having meditated, having eaten well and having a little coffee was um, a really nice, not having anything else to do as well because I was toying with the idea of coming up to the studio and then I was like, no, 
I'm going to do this instead. And things just started falling into place for me, which is, um, it was really exciting. And it makes me want to do it again, which is, is, you know, lowers the barrier to entry for next time. We'll do it again next weekend. And maybe before our next podcast, I'll try to uh, set aside two hours to do something non-music related that's still creative. Mm, that's a good plan, man. Because it just opens a different part of your brain. And like, also makes you, um, how are you going with your writing every morning? Uh, okay, I did them t- this morning and the last time I did them was Friday. So I didn't. Oh well, no! I didn't do them on Saturday. Yeah, the week the weekend can suffer for me. Like you know, if if I'm hung if I'm hung over, I'm not getting up first thing to write in my journal. It's nigh impossible. But I do reflect that night anyway, and I'm finding the the writing is is really good. It's like revealing. You know, it would have been like at least it would have been like eight weeks or something that I've been doing this. So, um. No, six. Six weeks writing every morning. And it's been really, yeah, positive in, in dumping ideas as well as just like having the flow of information. Are you keeping just three pages? Yeah, I do three pages, um, I'd say 80% of the time. And sometimes like, you know, but every day I'll do them. There's only one yeah. day I've, unless I'm was super hungover and, or something. I'm I've missed them then, but otherwise I'll do every day. Like there's been days where I'm like, I'm running late for work. Well I need to write a fucking page of stuff. So I'll just like write it down. And it's funny what comes out then. On on those ones where it's where it's rushed. Yeah. But that's always the the flow. Like if you start writing yeah. it too much, then it becomes less. And finding finding that balance as well. As you get to chapter four, I think it is, she talks a lot about the morning pages. A bit more. Okay. I hope you have a caring week for yourself and that you Thank um you. you are kind to yourself and you are kind to others. And uh Thank you. Yeah, I think um the show this weekend's gonna go really well and I'll send you some new tunes. Woo! Sweet. I look forward to it and I look forward to reflecting on the show next Monday. Yes. All right, buddy. I love you. I love you too, man. Bye. Thanks for listening to this week's podcast. Uh, Make sure you subscribe to us on your podcast app and keep up to date with all new episodes. They're going to be coming out once a week. We are Echo and Sidetrack on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, On Twitter, we are Echo Sidetrack. Go listen to our music on Spotify, Apple Music, Tidal, YouTube, or wherever your ears consume happiness. Lots of love, people.